better discrimination for the solution and the fluid, then you will get the best location for development wells or even uh, exploratory wells. It depends on the area of interest. And the third one is to minimize the exploration uncertainty, because if you are in an uh, exploration phase, you have to uh, minimize the exploration uncertainty so that you can pick what is, where, where is the best location to hit in your exploration phase. So we'll go the first thing, which is uh, the exploration seismic techniques. This is the first phase actually, which we'll call it qualitative seismic techniques because in the exploration phase we have as as we have mentioned we have uh, the the question which we we give it to you uh, in the exploration phase what do you recommend to do if you have no well penetration actually if you have no well penetrations we have only a seismic so we couldn't apply quantitative because quantitative seismic interpretation it needs a well penetration because from uh, from uh, well penetrations, we'll get the location of each well. We'll get some information from the logs, like the sonic, like density. We'll get what called the uh, acoustic impedance. So we'll use this impedance to make what called seismic inversion and a lot of other informations, which will be used for quantitative seismic uh, interpretation. So in the exploration phase, if you have no well penetrations, you could only apply a qualitative seismic interpretation technique, which will be discussed. This is its workflow. We will start for uh, the interpretation. We'll make structure contour maps, actually, uh, but in, in time domain, if you have a uh, time uh, time seismic, uh, time seismic cube, you will make an interpretation for the sequence boundaries you have, and sure, you have to get some information and some uh, uh, support from the geologist. He will give you and information about uh, where could you find uh, a channelized system in each uh, formation because he got the information about the area. He knows the geological column of the area of interest. He will give you an example. You can find the uh, channelized system in Blyson section. You can find the channelized system in Miocene and blah, blah, blah. It depends on the area of interest. So the first thing for the geophysical part, which is regional mapping. Regional mapping for everything. And regional mapping, we have to add also the faults. The faults is the main uh, contribution with the interpretation because here we have both. We have a structural interpretation and stratigraphic interpretation. Second thing we can get, which is the attributes, seismic attributes and make the screening. Actually, seismic attributes is one of the most uh, important uh, topics and things to uh, to be used for channelized system because as you know that uh, in uh, in the gas proven uh, areas or gas areas like channelized systems we have sand and shale so we have what called uh, DHI DHI which is direct hydrocarbon indicators the first thing in uh, DHI can can get you some information the first thing is uh, bright spot uh, flat spot dim spot AVO, which is amplitude variation with offset, and we can uh, get all this DHI information to get where is your channel, where is your gas, where is the extension of the reservoir. So uh, from seismic screening, we can get from seismic attributes, we can get some good information. Another thing you can do, uh, this is one example of uh, the, the attributes. Actually, we can define that we have two types of seismic attributes. We have what called a full bandwidth conventional seismic attributes, which used all the frequency content of your seismic data, like uh, AAA, which is average absolute amplitude. We can get our MS. So any geophysicist knows very well that we have a lot and the plenty of attributes that can he apply over the area of interest, but all of them can uh, get a name as this is a full bandwidth because it takes the full bandwidth of the seismic cube. But actually, we have another uh, important uh, topic or another important attribute, which is uh, a specific bandwidth uh, uh, seismic attribute. Specific bandwidth, this is called the spectral decomposition analysis. Spectral decomposition is one of the important things because it used the uh, uh, band limited frequency. As an example, if you have a seismic cube from 0 to 125 uh, hertz, so we can get where is the, the frequency content of the 
of the seismic cube. As an example, it will be starting from zero till 70 hertz. So you can divide these seismic cube uh, frequencies into seven cubes or eight cubes. It depends on how bands, uh, how band uh, limit you need. Because uh, as an example, we can get uh, every 10 hertz, we can get a seismic cube. So every 10 hertz will get seismic cube, we will get seven seismic cubes. So each of them will have a specific bandwidth and then we can make what called RGB color blending. As you see, we, the lowest number will be in red, most likely in green. The highest frequency value will be in blue. Sometimes it gives you another information uh, better than the, the conventional bandwidth seismic attribute. So spectral decomposition is a very important topic. And after delineation and uh, put, uh, highlighting the potential areas, you can get what called a gas in place or hydrocarbon place uh, for, for your area of interest. We can use uh, what called uh, Monte Carlo. Monte Carlo will give you uh, B50, B10, and B90 uh, numbers for your uh, gas in place uh, from, from this area. So this is what we can do or what we can apply for the exploration phase in any area of interest if we have only, only a seismic cube without any well penetration. So this is very helpful and will show you in deep and details of this uh, information about uh, this workflow. And then we can get a well proposal and uh, propose a new well location for any all of this uh, depends on our evaluation. Second thing which is very important actually and uh, very useful for our area, exact, uh, uh, especially in development areas, uh, which is quantitative. As we have mentioned, quantitative, so we have a well penetration, so we have some information from the wells. We have a VSP, we have a sonic log, we have a dentist log, we have gamma ray resistivity, so we have a plenty of logs so that we can use it in our uh, workflow for quantitative seismic analysis. Uh, the first thing we can get the check shot, which is a time depth relation from your VSB. If you are shooting any any type of VSB, zero offset or or or, or, uh, or offset VSB, we can get this uh, check shot, which is uh, time depth relation TDR. We can get it and do what called check shot velocity analysis because if any first uh, all of the first nodes that. Uh, when you try to make or use the check shot, uh, it, if you make uh, time versus depth relation, it will give you a direct proportional relation. But actually, this direct proportional relation sometimes it doesn't help for for the information or or synthetic or something like that because it has some sometimes a man issues because. When you are shooting, sometimes uh, there is some 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 errors in the shooting, some errors in the arm of the of the equipment. So the point will give you uh, an issue. So this issue is not uh, helpful and will give you in, in, in the synthetic or anything you need uh, use it. It will give you some sometimes a wrong uh, time to depth uh, uh, conversion or uh, synthetic well seismic type. So we, we, we have got uh, an idea about how to get to make it in another domain, which is average velocity domain or in terms of velocity domain, and make some uh, check shot velocity analysis, remove the odd points without playing with uh, the actual data. We are removing only, only excluding and not removing. We can exclude the points and make a new relation between the data and itself to get a new uh, a, a data set that could be used uh, easily. The second thing is uh, VSB tronic uh, correction. Uh, as we know that uh, most of uh, softwares use the, the TDR, which is extracting from the sonic and use it as a default. So we have an information or another information from the VSB. So we can get a correction between all of them to get what called the drift curve and to get uh, a better correction to be used for synthetic. And after that, we can make what called wavelet sensitivity analysis. This wavelet actually will be used to uh, not only in the world seismic toy, but also for the seismic inversion and EVO and all of any other QI uh, techniques. The 
then we can go to well to seismic tie and make also what called uh, well to seismic tie sensitivity analysis and we can apply maybe from 20 to 30 uh, well to seismic tie analysis to get what is the best fit uh, parameters to be used for your area so that you can get the best or the, the accurate location of the your marker inside your seismic data after that, we can go through then another thing. So we get uh, well to seismic tie. We can go the into the interpretation of the of, of your top reservoir, base reservoir as well. So you have a, a maps in time domain. You need to convert that uh, these maps in the depth domain. So we will make another uh, idea about the depth conversion to get a depth conversion with the plenty of, of types. And these types will be used to make a depth conversion sensitivity analysis to get which depth conversion method will be best fit and have the lowest error to, to be used for depth maps. And after that, we can go through the pre stack or post stack seismic inversion to quantify where is your gas uh, location and to penetrate or to add another development or uh, another development wells in the area. And after that, we can get, uh, this is the lithology and the flow discrimination. We can discriminate the gas and water from, from the whole seismic to get the actual net gas sand and the net water sand to be used uh, uh, in, in your calculations or any uh, thing to, uh, to be a very useful uh, thing or a very useful input for your uh, static modeling and dynamic model as well. So we will start to get the first thing, which is the qualitative seismic techniques. Indeed, we'll talk about regional mapping and screening, channel, channel identification and delineation, depth conversion, hydrocarbon in place, well location optimization. <clears throat> The first thing, which is the regional mapping and screening result, as we have mentioned that from geology, we know that this is a seabed. This is the first seconds boundary, second seconds boundary, third seconds boundary. From geology, we know that uh, this is the Bostani, this is Kafr Sheikh. So we have to get some information from uh, your uh, friend, the geologist, to give some information where we are and where we can find some channelized systems. So from here, we, we found something which is uh, some, some bright spot. And as we have mentioned that the DHI, which is bright spot, bright spot can be a good leading for gas presence. So we'll pick this one, the first uh, one as a top res uh, reservoir and second one, we'll pick this one as well. So we have an interpretation for all of this. We'll get this map to get some attributes from this attribute we can see that we have a channel system here and this area is a patchy amplitude maybe maybe it's a crevasse flay from this area but actually this is not because it's not the same trend of the channel this is another level of the channel so this is not the same channel so our main channel will be here Another thing which will be the the time map we have making uh, make a time map. This is a time map for the top uh, channel and this is a time map for the base channel. So we get the interpretation for the whole uh, channel uh, at, at this area. After that, we applied some attributes like this is what we have mentioned, a full bandwidth conventional attributes. Actually, this is not here because we have make a fine tuning for the interpretation. We found that it's not located in the same level. So we removed this one by the new interpretation. So this is the actual interpretation and this is your reservoir. So, but from this one, you can see some limitations like uh, we have a disconnection here, we have a disconnection here, we have some disconnection here. So we have some disconnection of, of, uh, of, of the channel. So maybe this is called compartmentalization. So we can uh, check this is a full bandwidth using the full bandwidth of the seismic cube. So we'll go another thing, which is spectral decomposition. As we have mentioned, spectral can use what called Fourier transform. Fourier transform can transfer any complex time series like the seismic traces into its initial frequency components. So we will use uh, all of these frequencies, try to get the best fit 
uh, iterations and make a color blending iterations to get which frequency will be used used as a useful uh, frequency content to be used for red, green, and blue, so that we can make a color blending. And from here, you can see easily where is the connection of the the channel. We have a we have a disconnection here over the full band uh, full bandwidth attribute, but from here we have a connection by red color. It means that we have. Uh, the connection in low frequency content, low frequency content, it means that we have something like a masking or something like uh, uh, masking of the seismic data by another shallower channel here. So we have a clear connection for the whole channel. So we can see that there is no compartmentalization over the whole channel, uh, definitely. And this is a polygon that we can capture for the whole channel. Another thing which is uh, will go through, which is depth conversion. Actually, from here we don't have any information uh, to be used for depth conversion because depth conversion we can use the check shoot data, we can use the wheel markers. <clears throat> but at this area, we mentioned that we will deal with it or we dealt with it as there is no wells, no wells in this area. So we will use only the the average velocity cube which come uh, with uh, which comes with uh, seismic cube from the processing center so we can use this cube as a depth conversion uh, method so this is the only method we can do in the exploration phase with no seismic uh, no well penetrations <clears throat> so this is actually the time map and this is a depth converted map by the velocity model using the average velocity cube and after that, we add the polygon. As you know, that we have to make like a combination between the structure and the, the stratigraphy to get the the best fit location for uh, to be penetrated. And this is the depth conversion also for the basic channel. So after that, we will uh, we make uh, something like uh, we get the seismic attributes from uh, we copy the seismic attributes from the time map and put it over the depth map so that we can uh, merge between the depth contours and the seismic amplitude for the channel system to get the best location we can penetrate. <clears throat> and this is the polygon. So we will make some uh, segmentation because uh, as we mentioned, we have here some disconnection and some uh, maybe we have some compartmentalization and also we have some structures which is not connected. So we will uh, make compartmentalization or segmentation for each uh, one to see what is uh, the relation between structure and uh, uh, seismic amplitudes. So this is the first compartment. You see here we have a, a structure like this. So this is the segment, the first segment. We can say that we have here a compartmentalization which relates to this uh, structure because most of the structure are open in, the, in another way. So this is the first segment. So we can get a small polygon over this area and we can make a, a gas water contact over 2000 meters. And this is actually the area. We calculated the area. It's 11 kilometer square kilometers and GRV is 33 uh, billion cubic feet. After that, we make a Monte Carlo. This Monte Carlo actually uh, we we uh, we will not use only one uh, one uh, deterministic value because, as you know, it's better to have B50, B10, and B90. We add B90 here as a low case because it's 90 percent. You can find this low number, and only 10 percent you can find the highest number. So sometimes or some uh, companies use the B10 is the lowest and uh, B90 as the highest, but for us, we use the B90 as the lowest because we have a great opportunity that 90% will get the lowest number. So this is actually the, the variables we can use for this area, and we calculated the, the main BCF, which we have uh, 600 uh, BCF for only this location or for only this segment. And from this one, we can get where is the highest structure. We have here the highest structure over this area. So we recommend the company to penetrate or to add an accelerator well at this area because this is the channel. This is the highest structure. So you can penetrate this one so that you can get all of them together. 
second segment actually we we add another another uh, another one we have removed this one because this is actually penetrated by another one so we have a small area of interest this one which is captured by this segment so we have calculated the, <coughs> the area of this which is 17 square kilometers and we have a grv like 40 bcf and we got uh, Monte Carlo uh, equation and we got B90, B10, B mean and B10 and B mean for here uh, gas in place is uh, near to B800 BCF. So from this one we got the highest structure and we say that this is actually the best fit or best location to be penetrated for uh, for the area of interest. So from this one we have finished our qualitative uh, seismic analysis techniques and my colleagues will show you a brainstorming uh, question will be uh, shown and we'll get one minute for the question uh, and after that we will get 10 minutes questions from the audience.
So I think we have now open for questions. Uh, we'll have about uh, 10 minutes. If you need to ask a question, please uh, use uh, raise hand uh, so that we can uh, open your mic. Our colleague will open your mic and we'll get your question. Please, Mudupe, go ahead with your question. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the presentation, Ali, my heart. Um, my question is revolving around the, uh, the first statement uh, you made and uh, the pop-up quiz that came up, that when is the time to use a quantitative uh, seismic uh, interpretation? So which involve uh, them well must be involved before we can use any of the two. But under the quantitative uh, interpretation, although is a tool that can help us to perform a geological and a geophysical interpretation as well as the reservoir characterization. But uh, we have uh, some other tools there. We have so many tools as so to say, in which you've already mentioned a part of it, like a uh, rock physics, we have a seismic conditioning, AVO modeling, AVO recognizance, and so on and so forth. But under the AVO recognizance, that's where my question is. Without the well, any of the well being drilled in a particular area, can't we use the AVO recognizance? Because his own work there is just to identify the anomaly that may indicate a hydrocarbon. So we now corroborate it with uh, what we have as our original, uh, either the pre stack or the post stack, because any of the two can be used based for the primary and the secondary attribute, which can be generated by choosing any of the super method. So in this regard, without having any well, can't we apply that particular tools to carry, out, to carry on with any of the quantitative analysis we want to carry, provided we can generate the volume, the VOI as well? Okay, thank you for your question and your uh, clarification. Actually, if we have no well penetration, so we will not uh, use any of uh, QI like seismic inversion. Uh, but if we have uh, some areas or or an area with uh, pre-stack seismic cubes with no well penetration, so we can make like what you have uh, mentioned, like uh, AVO, uh, we can use it actually without any well and the seismic conditioning for them because uh, before, as you know, we have some uh, what calls uh, uh, for, for the AVO, so, sometimes we have uh, some which is not aligned uh, together. Uh, this actually uh, we, we can apply uh, some some conditioning and uh, we can make uh, like thermostatics amplitude balancing. So we can use all of them to make all of our amplitudes aligned together, have the same uh, same uh, trim statics, have the same uh, frequency uh, uh, filtering. And after that, we can apply only, only we can apply the AVO. And as you know that uh, from the AVO, we have a classes, we have class one, class two, class three. Uh, so from what we have in, in gas, gas only uh, presented by uh, by two two things, which is class two and class three. So from the qualitative part, we can use an AVO without any well penetration. We can use our AVO without any well penetration. But for the seismic inversion, we couldn't actually use any seismic inversion technique without any well penetrations, as you know, because as we will uh, mention uh, in the second part. Uh, from the QI, we use uh, sonic and density logs so that we can get the seismic inversion results. I think, uh, I hope this uh, applies to your question. Uh, and, uh, and I have uh, another add for that. Uh, actually, uh, if we have offset wells in the area and we know the EPO model for these wells, for example, if our gas sand is class 3, so if we are in, in exploration phase, we will look to the angle stack to see the EPO model in the area. 
and we will cover it in our uh, uncertainty analysis and the chance of success. So we can use our analog uh, to know uh, the EBU model uh, for the water and gas, even oil, uh, and we will validate that after drilling uh, the first well in the area. So, any other questions? Um, thank you very much. Um, but thanks so much. The only thing I just need to gather then is that uh, we still have uh, some tools in which we can even use without any well uh, penetration out of uh, some other tools that we have for under the, for the quantitative uh, analysis. That's why, really? For that, the one that we just explained now. Hello. Hello. Can anybody hear me? Yeah, we hear you. You can you can go. OK, thanks. If there are no more questions, please, Dr. Rami can go ahead with the second segment of the presentation. Thank you. OK, we can go to uh, second part of our presentation now. So this is the second part of our presentation, which is quantitative seismic analysis techniques. Uh, as we have mentioned, if we need to apply a quantitative seismic techniques, we have to have in at least at least one well penetrating this uh, area of interest or this seismic cube because for this uh, area we couldn't use an analog we can use analog for only if we all response if we are in 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 some area like this at this location and we have a well in this area and this well get, getting some gas response with the class 2 or class 3 so any uh, area of class two or class three in our location or our area should be in class two or class three. This is the only way we can get an analog for the AVO. But for the QI or the seismic inversion, we have to get a penetration inside inside the seismic cube. So if you have uh, an extension for the seismic cube and we have a, a, a penetration from a uh, far well, we can use it. But actually, it couldn't give a very good information because we need at least one well penetrating our channel so that it can give like an extension for the whole uh, the whole uh, channel or the whole field uh, exactly and we'll show you now uh, uh, example of this so we'll get uh, the well penetrations uh, road check shot uh, qc and velocity analysis uh, check shot correction vsp correction <clears throat> and wavelet extraction sensitivity analysis, uh, will to seismic type calibrated or QC, depth conversion and flow lithology discrimination. The first thing actually we have uh, mentioned previously in the qualitative or the exploration phase that we have recommended uh, places in the first segment and the places in and the second segment. Actually, uh, we had uh, two penetrations here in this uh, segment and one here, and we have in this segment you have only one well penetration, and this is the results of uh, the four uh, wells. We have uh, two exploratory wells. The, third, the three of uh, the first three uh, wells in the segment in the south, and this is the only well in the uh, northern part of the channel. <coughs> Sorry. Actually, uh, from this well, we uh, we found uh, 85 meter sand with 59 meter gas, and from here we found 125 meter sand and with uh, 90 meter gas. From this well, we found the 95 meter sand with 72 meter gas, and the northern part we found 56 meter sand with 34 meter 
gas. So uh, this is called, uh, we, we call this channel as uh, channel 13, penetrated by the four wells, uh, one ex uh, three wells in the southern part and one well in the northern part. The first uh, uh, step in our uh, QI work or the, the the effective work we do, actually we will get the what called the check shot velocity analysis. As we mentioned, most of geophysics use only two-way time versus depth uh, equation to get a, a direct proportional relation between uh, uh, between them. So you will not find any issues for for the for the for the check shot data, but if we make another uh, thing or another representation for it, uh, instantaneous average velocity versus depth or instantaneous interval velocity versus depth, sometimes you will find some issues which will be removed uh, or excluded from the data so that it will not affect our uh, well to seismic tie or depth conversion. So this is a second part, which is the check shot correction. As we mentioned that um, this is, uh, as an example, this is a software called uh, Hamsa Russell. It used, uh, uh, most of, uh, of softwares also used the check shot comes from the sonic log as a default. So we will get the information from the sonic log, TDR from sonic and the VSB uh, TDR. And it will make what called a drift curve uh, analysis drift curve. It means that as we know that uh, VSB, VSB, uh, the, the sonic, sonic has a higher velocity than VSB. So uh, it has a lower time than VSB. So drift curve, it, it, uh, it equal times from VSB minus times from uh, sonic. So it should be positive. It positive, it means proper indication that sonic log velocity are higher than VSB velocity and your data is good. So this step can give us some information about how good uh, Sonic is. Second part will be used. This is uh, <coughs> after, uh, this is before check shot correction. Actually, they don't have the, the same scale. So the seismic here will not have the same scale of the logs. And after check shot correction, we make an upscaling for the check shot, which comes from uh, Sonic, and to get the relation between the seismic data and our uh, logs uh, exactly. After that, we need to make uh, seismic wavelet extraction or wavelet extraction. Actually, as we mentioned that <coughs> wavelet is very important for our, our work because wavelet will be used uh, not only for uh, world seismic tie, but also it will be used for uh, AVO, for inversion. It will be used for a lot of things actually. So we have to make a sensitivity analysis to know what is the best fit wavelet to be used for the whole study. Actually, not only for synthetic, but also for AVO and inversion. So from here, we have some equations which will be used uh, to extract our wavelet, even it is statistically from seismic or deterministic by using seismic and wells. So from here, we get some parameters uh, for, for, for this uh, seismic cube. We have a phase rotation uh, 180 because this is uh, a polarity reversed seismic cube. So the phase shift, we have uh, 180 uh, degrees. And this is a full stack seismic cube. We get some wavelet extraction. This is the first one, which is uh, wavelet lens. This is a taper lens side loops. This is time extraction window. This is PT, and we have some parameters. The first thing, this is the wavelet lens we will be used for the wavelet. Taper lens, uh, which is the side loops of the wavelet, it should be not less than uh, of 10% and not higher than 80% from the wavelet lens. And time extraction window, you know a specific time extraction window from your area of interest, but it's preferred to have about uh, from 300 uh, to 500 millisecond uh, window so that it could be captured from, uh, from the seismic to get a very good wavelet lens. And BT, which is called uh, uh, wavelet quality. Wavelet quality, it calculates the relation between time extraction window and wavelet lens, and sure table lens is included with, with this one. So we have a relation between time extraction window and wavelet lens so that we can get the BT, which is uh, the wavelet quality. After that, we can get the correction correlation window, which will be used for the synthetic correlation window will be used to get our maximum correlation number. This 
this is the number I think most of geophysicists use this one as the indication for the, the synthetic, is it good or not? But actually, this is one value uh, uh, within a lot of values should be used for uh, adjusting or uh, justifying our uh, well to seismic type. Another, another thing which will be used or calculated, which is PEP, PEP, proportional of energy predicted, which indicates our goodness of well tie fit, which is a <coughs> square of uh, our correlation coefficient. So this number should be uh, higher than 60%. And after that, we can calculate normalized square error for the whole parameters and the whole calculations we have done. And uh, for the normalized square error, all of this actually should be not more than 10%. It's it uh, should be not more than 10% <clears throat> so that we can say that we have a very good or a perfect will to seismic tie. <coughs> Sorry. So normalized square error will be our uh, our final uh, judgment uh, equation. So from this, we can get that all the green are the best fit or the orange is not that good. Uh, it's higher than 10 percent. So we have five, five, uh, five wavelets here. Uh, all of them have a very good uh, normal square error. And also we have get these equations or these parameters, five well, uh, wavelet parameters. We get this information to extract another wavelet with, this, with these parameters. All of these numbers are statistical wavelet using only seismic. And after getting the best fit f wavelets from the seismic, we get that, that information to extract uh, wavelets from uh, on, uh, seismic and integrated with wells. So we have another five wells, uh, wavelets. So we make a comparison before uh, between these five wavelets and these five wavelets from the well log and the seismic. And we get that this one or this wavelet is the best fit to be used for well to seismic tie. But actually, <clears throat> these wavelets will be used, the statistical one will be used for seismic inversion. Sometimes it's better than the wavelets which used in the by deterministic way, because in this deterministic way, we extracted a wavelet over one well location. But for these uh, statistical wavelets, we got some information for the whole seismic, which covers the whole uh, channel. So these wavelets will be useful or better than the wavelets extracted only at a well location. So for our seismic inversion, uh, these statistical five statistical wavelets will be used as uh, seismic inversion iterations for the analysis to be used for uh, our work. <clears throat> this is actually before well to seismic tie and after well seismic tie. You see after a lot of uh, information, a lot of uh, quality control, we got a perfect synthetic. Actually, even before the well seismic tie, we have the marker in, in, in the middle of our uh, reflector. And this is before and after you see a small, very, very small shift, which is not being uh, even <coughs> uh, feel it. You can you can feel that before it, you can use only also the interpretation and this is our top channel. So after that, we'll go to another uh, method or another step, which is the depth conversion. As we have mentioned, that depth conversion is very, very important for us because uh, all the REs needs uh, depth maps. If if any geophysicist give a time map for any uh, RE and say this is our channel, this is our, our amplitude, this is our location, actually for the RE, it's not useful because they need <coughs> they need only a depth uh, structure control map. So we have to make a depth conversion with the sensitivity to get the best fit depth converted map. So uh, for depth conversion methodologies, actually we have uh, two main parts. We have single layer models and we have a multi-layer models. Single layer models, we can use what called 2D pseudo velocity. Pseudo velocity, it, it used what? It used only the well markers. So if you have uh, like, like our example, we have uh, four wells, so you you know that uh, this, is, you know from the well penetrations or markers from the well, you know the top reservoir very well in depth. 
so easily you can get uh, some information from this one you can uh, <coughs> divide divide these well markers over your time map it will give you a velocity uh, function or a velocity uh, markers these velocity markers could be uh, make uh, like you can make like a surface which is called a pseudo velocity map and you can uh, make a multiplication between this velocity map and your time map and you will get a perfect depth map this is the first <coughs> thing or the best as the first uh, method this is actually uh, mostly used in most of uh, locations if you have no check shoot data because in some areas as we know that they don't need uh, to apply or they uh, some some companies need to make some uh, cost reduction and they didn't make uh, VSB over the wells so we have no check shoot data for for any well so we need to do a depth conversion so we can use <coughs> the markers to make a depth conversion <coughs> This is most commonly used in most of companies, actually. The second thing, which is also a single layer model, which is a 2D order polynomial, uh, second order polynomial function using well TDR, check shot data. So we can get the check shot data calibrated after the synthetic. After synthetic, we will get another check shot so we can extract <coughs> or get all the information from the whole wells, all the wells together. As an example, we have four wells here. We can stack all the check shots from the four wells and we get them together and to get uh, a second order equation, this equation can be used directly to make a depth conversion from time to depth. So this is <coughs> the two steps are the single layer model. We have another thing which is preferred to some uh, companies or preferred to some geophysicists, but it's slightly complicated than the single layer models, which is the velocity modeling. Velocity modeling, you know that we have a model, 3D model for velocity. So we have uh, plenty of iterations or uh, plenty of uh, uh, methods for the multi-layer models. Actually, we can make a 3D or we made 3D simple layer model, uh, simple velocity model, which used the average velocity cube, which we have applied in the exploration phase. Actually, uh, another velocity uh, model used the velocity cube using a uh, dex conversion because sometimes you can use average velocity or interval velocity. So we have both uh, cubes. So we use the two different uh, velocity models. <coughs> Sorry. Third one, we have used a velocity model using well TDR, which is check shot data calibrated V node K method. V node is the initial interval velocity and the K is the slope for the data. And we used a method which called V node <coughs> constant contouring method for V node and K. Constant contouring method actually, it used the numbers of uh, V node for each well and make a contouring, but this contouring is limited uh, surrounding the, the V node, which is restricted by the numbers of each well location. Uh, this is the first method. Second method, it's called surface contouring method. It can make like a grad, uh, degradation or uh, trying to make uh, extraction or extrapolation for the numbers everywhere for uh, surface contouring method. And we used most of them to make what called depth conversion sensitivity analysis. And actually, this is the final result <coughs> of the depth conversion. Actually, we, we, we have a lot of things in this part, but we show to you only the results so that you can from here, you know uh, how much we have a lot of iterations for the depth conversion over the top channel, we have like eight, eight velocity models or eight methods. We have here from here, we can get where is the lower uh, error, or lowest error uh, method, which from here to the velocity, as you see here from pseudo velocity, it gives us zero error. I think yani, mostly it's zero error over the whole area over the top. The same thing applied, <coughs> the same thing applied uh, for uh, base uh, channel and base gas. And this is actually the depth converted map. You see, this is a depth converted map, and this is what called flexed. Flexed, it means that, uh, as we had mentioned here, we have here maybe 0.01 uh, meter uh, shift. So we need to remove that shift. Actually, it will not affect our depth conversion or, 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 or our map, but sometimes we need to do it. If we have like 10 meters here, five meters here, so we can get that flexing method. This flexing remove 
even the small shift. So from here, actually they are the same after removing the shift, but actually we don't have any shift here. This is a base gas, the same thing. Actually, 2D uh, pseudo velocity uh, was the best fit depth conversion method at, at this area. And this is the depth map, and this is the flexit as well to remove the shift. <clears throat> Third one, which is the base channel, that also our 2D pseudo velocity method was the best fit uh, depth conversion methodology in that area. This is a uh, depth converted, and this is the flexit. But before going to flow lithology discrimination, I have to mention that not uh, not all the time 2D pseudo velocity will be better. Sometimes 2D uh, normal function. Sometimes one of the velocity models will be your best fit. So for each area, it may be different. Maybe you have a field here. You have another field which may be very near to it, and it its depth conversion method will be better in some uh, other ways. So you have to apply all the methods and after that make depth conversion sensitivity analysis and after depth conversion sensitivity analysis <coughs> we can get we can get our uh, best fit depth map to be used uh, for any further uh, workflow so we have the we have finished the first part this is a second part actually which is a very important part which is a, uh, the main core of the qi which is fluid and the lithology discrimination we have to discriminate not only the the lithology but also the fluid <clears throat> actually the first thing or the first step in in, uh, in our uh, qi part which is uh, rock physics cross plots sometimes it's called uh, inversion feasibility study. We can, this is an example of uh, one well, actually we have four wells, but for this study we will use only one well as a key well in, in the inversion result and we'll QC over the whole three wells. We will not uh, use any other wells in our uh, inversion study so that we can get <coughs> some information and make a QC not only uh, by one well, we will make a QC by three wells. <coughs> Uh, this rock physics cross blots is the main core, uh, as we mentioned, for the seismic conversion. This is a relation between B impedance ZB or IB and uh, S impedance ZB. So we'll get in the X axis the B impedance, which is rho versus V. Rho is density and VB, which is a compressional sonic. And this is the S impedance is the Y axis, <coughs> which is rho times by VS which is density times by uh, shear sonic. So after getting this information, we'll make a lithology log using both gamma ray and resistivity to try to discriminate between gas, water, and shear. <clears throat> after getting that uh, lithology log, you can easily from uh, from visually, visually you can see that we have the gas at this area, you have uh, shale in this area, you have uh, water in this area. So the concept is, if we make a discrimination of gas, water, and shale over the B impedance, so we will apply post stack inversion. If we have the discrimination over the S impedance, so we will apply pre stack inversion. If you have neither discrimination over B impedance or nor in S impedance, so inversion will be not sufficient at this area to discriminate the fluid. We can discriminate the lithology, but it will not discriminate the fluid. So you have to think, you have to check where is your discrimination over over what? Over the B impedance. So over the S impedance, you will have to apply pre stack inversion. If uh, over the B impedance, so both stack is sufficient enough. So I will get a question why we could apply, why you are saying that if we got a, a discrimination here, you will apply post stack. If you have discrimination here, you will apply pre stack because uh, the inputs over B impedance <coughs> or the inputs for the post stack inversion only, we have a full stack seismic cube. We need to get from well penetrations, we need to get uh, sonic and com uh, compressional sonic and density. So we have compressional sonic, so we'll apply B impedance. From the S impedance and the result also will be only a B impedance. So the result of both stack will get B impedance. But for the S impedance inversion <coughs> or the S impedance pre stack inversion, what it will give us, the input is what? The input is pre stack data, near, mid, and far 
we can also we can get or the input uh, a row which is density and vs vs vb and vs vs is shear sonic vb is a compressional sonic the result will be what the result will give us b impedance cube and s impedance cube so that we know that uh, idea about rock physics cross but so from here we can say that we have a clear <coughs> discrimination over the e b impedance so we we will apply a post stack seismic inversion and actually, we make uh, a, a QC over this uh, uh, cutoffs. This is ZB from the from from here, and this is ZS S impedance. Uh, this is a real log uh, water saturation V shale gamma ray and resistivity. We can have a complete or a good a good tie between our uh, prediction number or numbers we have or cutoffs we have over gas over water over shale as well and from here we can get that we have uh, gas uh, from uh, maybe uh, 200 uh, 2500 uh, over than uh, 3600 and shale from 3600 to 4600 and water is uh, the rest of the of the data so we have a cut here as we have mentioned before for the wavelet, the second part, we have mentioned that we have five statistical wavelet represent all the seismic cube, which will be used for seismic inversion. So we'll use five, these are the five seismic wavelets, which will be used. And actually, uh, we'll use it uh, to make uh, our seismic inversion. And after that, we make what called initial uh, model. Initial model, this is the first thing to be applied over the seismic inversion because you will make uh, initial model. It's it's mo uh, most likely like a container. This container have some information, <coughs> some information from the data and uh, this information will be used uh, to be a container for the seismic inversion. <coughs> so uh, this this actually this is the initial model uh, we used one well which is uh, uh, SO one well <coughs> we used it uh, we have uh, this is a container and this is the impedance log which is uh, density uh, times by VB after that we'll make seismic inversion sensitivity analysis seismic inversion sensitivity analysis <coughs> will use the seismic wavelet actually this is a seismic wavelet here we have a seismic wavelet uh, we have five seismic wavelets we'll make some iterations this is the first iteration second iteration third one fourth one and fifth from here we can get that this is the best fit wavelet because the correlation is 99.06 uh, uh, percent so this is the best fit because this is lower than this is uh, lower uh, correlation coefficient. This is the best fit wavelet to be used for our seismic inversion. So we have applied our seismic inversion actually, and this is actually is a blue color is the gas uh, of uh, this is our gas actually, which extends over here. Uh, this is a better line uh, over uh, our well. And this is another better line containing all the wells. We can QC over the three wells you see is the first well second well third well you can see that <coughs> gas is also included in 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 other uh, wells and this is a map actually we get a minimum uh, amplitude value over the seismic inversion analysis over the top of our reservoir to see the extension of the gas everywhere and after that we applied we applied the cutoffs which we got from the rock physics cross plots. We can get that uh, values or that that information and make that cutoff these cutoffs over our uh, our data or our inversion data to have uh, uh, facies data. Facies which con includes uh, three types: gas, water, and shale. Gas in yellow, water in blue, and the shale in gray. So this is actually the final result of <coughs> Uh, fluid lithology discrimination and this is another another line which passes through the whole channel this is the three wells uh, from here and another, after that we can get or make like geobody extraction 
for the whole channel from our data of interest to see the net gas uh, voxels or values which could be easily used for uh, static modeling and dynamic modeling as well. And this is a water extension as well for the whole <coughs> area of interest. They are both together here. So uh, from here we can get these numbers. Actually, this is the net gas sand. We can use this net gas sand <coughs> in our uh, parameters of gas in place. Actually, to get uh, how much we have uh, for gas in the whole uh, channel, we have here about one TCF for the whole uh, channel. So this is actually all of our what we have in uh, qualitative uh, and quantitative seismic interpretation uh, techniques. And now we have another uh, question, brainstorming question before going to our conclusion. Our colleagues will show you a question now. We'll get one minute and then we'll continue to our conclusion. So I think we can uh, go to the final <coughs> final uh, part of our presentation here, which is our conclusion, and then we can get your questions and to reply over it. <coughs> our conclusion actually in, in exploration phase, we can apply if you have no seismic cubes, we have uh, we have only seismic cube, we have no well penetrations. We will apply a qualitative uh, techniques uh, like seismic attributes, spectral decomposition, and we can make a depth conversion using only the seismic uh, velocity cube. And for the development phase, actually, we can use uh, both. We can use qualitative and quantitative seismic analysis technique, and we can get some information uh, from uh, rock physics cross plots. Actually, we can apply rock physics cross plots to be a guidance for our seismic inversion uh, to be applied, and then we can make like uh, faces and lithology discrimination. And uh, actually, uh, this is the final conclusion of our recommendation in, in our area of interest. We recommend to add a development well in the northern part of the channel. So I have finished all what we have now, and it's time for uh, questions. If you need to ask any question, please uh, use the raise hand and our colleagues will open your mic so that we can ask and uh, we can answer. Thank you so much. So do we have any questions? Although Daniel, please go ahead with your question. Thank you.
Thanks, Daniel is not ready. Suleiman Kazim, can you please go ahead with your question? Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. And thanks for the nice uh, presentation. Thank you. Yeah. My questions are like three, three questions. Yeah. Number one, you said that uh, in a uh, wavelet extraction, statistical method is better than uh, the deterministic method because statistical method <clears throat> cut across all the seismic data while deterministic is localized to the world. But uh, from your presentation, what we use to constrain our data are well information. So don't you think that uh, if we are now comparing uh, the well information with uh, statistics that data derived from maybe another place, don't you think that uh, we are not uh, partially correct correlating the same thing? That is number one question. Number two, your wavelet extraction. At least, I hardly see a wavelet that is completely zero phase. But what you have there, there is no even time sheet. There is no, it's just exactly zero. Are, are, are you sure that is real? Practically? That is number two. Then the third question is on. Uh, the pre-stack and uh, post-stack uh, data for the AVO. So which one is the best? Because there is this school of thought that uh, pre-stack data is uh, better than post-stack. So which one do you think that uh, is the best <clears throat> based on your own experience? Thank okay, you. thank you for thank you for your questions. Uh, the first question you need to know uh, why we use the statistical. Why I said that statistical wavelet is better than the deterministic over over the area. Actually, if you have uh, in your area one well, so you can use a deterministic wavelet. It will be better for your area if you have only one well at your location. So. Uh, because you will get all the information from that well location and extend it along to the whole uh, channel or the whole direction of the field. So in this situation, but if you have another wells which you need to QC or you need to to have some information about. So from our case, we used statistical wavelet because statistical wavelet actually is it's uh, extracted over the whole channel, over the whole seismic cube, not only uh designed over a specific well location so for this or for our uh, area we use that one so if we can make it uh, uh, easily if we have uh, plenty of wells so it's better to have a statistical wavelet if you have only one well you can use deterministic and it will be uh, better this is actually the answer of the first question Second question about the zero phase of the wavelet. Actually, uh, I have used 180 degrees wavelet, but actually in this seismic cube, it means zero phase. Zero phase, as we have, uh, as we all know that most of our seismic data are zero phase. So the, the wavelet should be zero phase as the same of seismic, but we have two different <coughs> polarity. We have Normal polarity, we have reversed polarity. Normal polarity, it's like the gas is uh, is trough. Reverse polarity, gas is big. So if you have gas is trough, this is normal polarity, so your zero phase will be zero degree. If you have a reversed polarity, which is gas is peak 
So your zero phase will be 180 degree. This is the answer of the <coughs> second question. Third question you asked about pre-stack and post-stack uh, inversion, uh, which is the best. Actually, <coughs> from our work, uh, we couldn't say that pre-stack is the best or post-stack is the best. The, the only we will give us this information will be the rock physics cross plots. As we have mentioned here, <coughs> the rock physics will be the guidance. It will be the judge, actually, because if we apply rock physics cross plot, as you have mentioned here in that slide, if we have a cutoff over the B impedance, so in that case, both the stack will be the best. Top. If we have a pre uh, 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 cutoffs over, so here, S impedance or the brief stack inversion will be not good at this area. So if you have applied brief stack, it will give us no uh, other information. But if we have a cutoffs over the S impedance, so brief stack will be the best and the most stack will not give us any information. Actually, I think, I, I hope I, uh, I have answered your questions and if you have any clarification or questions, happy to hear from you. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, thank you. But on the uh, the second one, when you do your your extraction, so what I mean is that, do you have any any tolerance? Because uh, I did not see your wavelet is just pointed at zero. What I mean is that you didn't have any. I mean, maybe the shift value in that uh, your presentation. Is it possible? Because we are correlating with well information, they are not the same uh, frequency. You know, they they are they are not, they did not uh, they did not uh, uh, acquire them the same way. You know, and uh, noise and all those things involved. So you getting, I mean, in that wavelength, everything is zero. So that is uh, you don't have any shifts. I mean, that because based on our experience. At least there is no way you will not have maybe plus or minus time shift when you do your your deterministic uh, uh, extraction. So, but when you do your statistic, it's like you are modeling. You know, it's like that is a, not a real time uh, situation. I mean, that is not practical. It's like okay, you assume that is model. So. In that case, when you model, definitely it will be zero. Everything will converge at zero. But when you use deterministic, you are extracting from the exact data that was acquired, and you can never get a complete zero phase without any shift, without any time shift. That is what I mean. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your clarification. I got your idea. Actually, I think you are talking about the statistical wavelet over betrayal because betrayal using the idealized wavelet like Raker or something like that, it called in betrayal statistical. But actually in that uh, software in Hamza Russell, statistical means it's completely extracting from seismic. This is not uh, statistical as an idealized. This is not a Raker actually. This is a, a real data. It's from the seismic itself. It, it, it completely differs from betrayal uh, statistical wavelet because it, it's some issues I know that from betrayal, I have mentioned that Raker is a statistical because it used statistics to apply uh, something like from algorithm or something like from, from mass, it can identify or extract a wavelet. But from this uh, equation or from this, Actually, this is extraction from the real data itself, not not like Raker or something like that. <clears throat> and another thing, which is uh, the phase shift or something like, you know, as you mentioned that we sure we have some uh, issues, we have some uh, maybe noise in, in the seismic data. So we need to make the ex exact shift. Exact shift, actually, we can get it by the deterministic, we can, if you get the deterministic, it will give you the exact shift. But actually from here, as we have mentioned, we have a, 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 a clear a big channel. So I will not use the deterministic because this deterministic will be only acquired with the shift over the well location. So if the shift or the, the noise 
is not the same everywhere at the same channel, so it will give you or give us another information. So that we have said that statistical, which is from real seismic data, not record, it will be best fit for our location. I, ho I hope to, that is clear for you and your, uh, your questions and uh, happy to hear from you if you have any clarification again. Thank you very much, Dr. Ali. Wofika, please, you can go ahead with your question. Please, we have sent a feedback form for everyone to please fill. We we'll appreciate if you can take like two minutes to do that while the question is going on. Wofika, please go ahead with your question. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for this wonderful presentation. Um, is there a point where your maximum correlation, your like when you get to the spectra, the well, uh, wavelength extraction window, your correlation is less than maybe 60%, but when you check it out, with, when you um, correlate it with your, with your seismic, it's still a better match than those that are like 65%. And the um, software I use will have two wavelength extraction, the spectral analysis and the size work. And the spectral analysis is always less than um, 60%. The times that I can have 45%, 40%. And when you look at it in the in your window, it's a better match than the size wall correlation that is at like 65%, 70%. I'm talking of the maximum correlation. So in this case, which one are you going to choose? Is it the one that is having a better correlation or the one that is having a better match uh, looking at it physically? Yeah, thank you for your question. Actually, <clears throat> we have to differentiate between two things, the maximum or the extraction window for the wavelet and the maximum correlation window. The extraction window, which we, we have get the uh, ex, uh, extracting the wavelet from it. This extraction window should be should be not less than 300 meters and not to exceed 500 meters. This is the extraction of the wavelet. But as you mentioned, the maximum correlation, you get a lower maximum correlation for for uh, for the synthetic, actually, if you uh, what what I I suggest that the correlation window you used is very very big. Maybe it's cover or it covers the whole uh, well log. Actually, this is the basic or the default for each maximum correlation. Maybe for Betrayal or Hamza Russell or any other uh, well to seismic tie uh, software. When you apply a synthetic the maximum correlation it will be depends on what depends on the whole well actually but you have to do what you have to do like 100 millisecond over the top reservoir and 100 millisecond <coughs> below the base reservoir so you will cover the reservoir and 100 over 100 below so this is the optimum actually which will give you the exact values or the exact number which will represent your area of interest. I don't need to have a correlation window of the whole seismic or, or the whole well log from the base, from seabed to uh, to the TD, because all of this will not affect or, or, or it will not be helpful for us to identify where is the best fit location, because what I need to do is uh, well to seismic tie over that reservoir. So if you have one reservoir, you have to do what we have mentioned, 100 millisecond below, 100 millisecond above. If you have a multi-target, so you have to capture the same thing, your multi-target 100 millisecond over the shallowest one, 100 millisecond below the uh, deepest one. Uh, I hope that uh, answered your question and happy to hear if you have any other questions. Yeah, that's a my question. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much for your question, Wofika. Please take take out like two minutes to please fill the feedback form. It's being dropped on the chat section of this meeting link. Please, we appreciate your feedback. Thank you. 
Oh, well, you can please go ahead with your question. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, thank, thank you very much, Alima. Alima here for the presentation. It was very insightful. Uh, my question is, um, I look at the data, is um, water depth was between 500 to 1 kilometer. So I suppose that it, will, it will be a long offset data, so to say. And if it is, then I want to know how you incorporated uh, anisotropy, especially when you are calib calibrating the check shots. That is, um, that's one. Then number two is just uh, probably is a comment. When you show the sonic sonic log versus the drift, I thought you would, I expected to see the check shot trend, the sonic trend, sonic trend, and then the um, drift, and probably percentage mis misfit or something like that, so that it will give give us uh, a real picture, or maybe five percent, ten percent misfit between the uh, so sonic and, and your drift or something like that. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. Actually, regarding the check shot anisotropy, <coughs> sure you have. Uh, we have we have a, a very huge channel with a huge uh, lens and a huge uh, thickness as well. Uh, but for check shot anisotropy, uh, this is actually what we can do for uh, check shot. Uh, correction actually uh, the first thing we have to do is what is to make <coughs> what called uh, removing the information of the of, uh, we have a tvd sub c so we removed our uh, our information about the water itself so uh, water is removed from our data so it will not affect our data the second thing which is the effect of the overburden this one which will uh, will be uh, seen actually if you make another representation for the check shot data in the average velocity versus depth and interval velocity versus depth actually it will give you all the undesired data which could be excluded to have a clear data that uh, could be have no noise or no issues which will be uh, a, a, key, a, a very good qc for an isotropy. This is the first one. The second one regarding the drift curve, <clears throat> as we have mentioned, we have two different uh, check shots, one from Sonic and one from PSP. As we have mentioned that uh, Sonic log uh, has a higher velocity than VSV. So the time of Sonic log will be lower than the time of VSV. So when we uh, make uh, a subtraction uh, time from VSV minus time from Sonic, it will give us the drift. The drift should be in positive to have a good indication that the Sonic is higher than the VSB. And sure, this check shot is after, after the, the, uh, the VSB check shot is after the correction. So we have the first correction for the check shot here. Second cor uh, correction, which with the Sonic TDR to have the drift analysis to get the numbers. And actually from this point, we have what called spline fitting. Spline fitting using for what? Using to uh, to capture the whole points. Actually, if you see, we have plenty of points here. So every point, it will be make like a difference between all of them, these uh, blue points. So uh, another another software like Betrayal used only one function trying to get uh, a linear fitting actually. But this linear fitting will give you a small number of drift, but it will not be helpful. It not will be actual data because if you make a trend line, trend line, it will give you only a trend. So it will capture or make an upscaling, but a virtual upscaling. So it will give you some uh, not not that good information. But from here, why we have uh, high numbers? Because we have make a spline fitting to fit all the drift between the check shot from VSP and check shot from Sonic. I uh, I hope this uh, questions answer uh, ans my answer uh, is uh, is yeah. better for you and yeah it is it is thank you very much um, uh, so so let me just make one last comment uh, I had your discussion bet between uh, Kazim Suleiman and, uh, on, on the wave wavelet extraction you know yeah sure um, on a general note when you say statistical it's it's clear it's, it's extraction from a volume the whole volume, you take a lot from the volume and do statistical uh, analysis, and then you, you, know, you, you get the best fit out of it, you know. 
So yeah. I, I think um, I just want to I just want to add my my voice to that. Thank you. Sure. Sure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And I have to mention another thing. This is not actually not the whole seismic cube. We have made a cropped volume for the area of interest or the channel itself so that I will not have to extract a wavelet from the whole seismic if you have a huge area. So we make like a small cube in, in our first work to capture only only this area of interest. I don't need to extract the whole volume for all of this. And thank you. Any other questions? Thank you all so much for your question. Is Olu Daniel, do you still have your question to ask? Okay, I think Olu Daniel is no longer asking his questions. Okay, so we have Zaid Oyeleke for a question. Please, Zaid, go ahead with your question. Uh, hello. Uh, thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, I think that was uh, quite educative, but uh, my my question is just uh, pretty straightforward. What if uh, the particular check shot was not actually acquired in in that well? Maybe it's a borrowed check shot. Would you still advise we go ahead with that calibration to to Sonic, um, the one you just um, shown here? Yeah, on, on that particular slide. Yeah, the slide. So yeah. would you would you advise that? Um, uh, the sonic is calibrated to, to the check shot if it wasn't really acquired in that uh, particular well. And if the sonic is not uh, prone to bowl um, uh, conditions, um, do you think uh, it will still uh, be required uh, to have this calibration? Thank you. Thank you for your uh, question. Actually, in this part, we have two different things. If the sonic is not good, if we have make like uh, the first thing we have to apply is uh, is, is a check shot velocity analysis. Uh, from here, if you get a negative drift, so our sonic will be not that good. So uh, the better, this is the first part. So uh, I will ask the petrophysicist to have uh, another check for the sonic itself because uh, I know that I, I make a QC for the check shot. So I will ask my colleague uh, petrophysicist to check or recheck or double check the sonic log. So if we leave check uh, uh, the sonic and he said the sonic is very good, so I don't have any issues in it and you have still negative drift, uh, this is will give us the second part, which will be you have to recheck the original uh, VSB from the report itself. So my opinion, don't use any check shot from any Excel sheet from your company. Even if you know that it's the source, it's the original, you have to have the original uh, CD or the original BDF acquired from uh, the company of acquisition of VSP to check if you have the real data, because I, I face that a lot. Actually, every time I ask for a check shot, they give me an Excel sheet. And uh, if I make my double check, to get the original CD, I found that it's completely different information or different numbers from the check shot I got from the CD, original CD, and the, the check shot in the Excel sheets in the company. So uh, my advice is you have to acquire, you have to check the original. But if after all you find something is not that good, so uh, you can do it even it is negative drift, because you will make an upscaling, but you can say that we have, you have to mention for your colleagues that we have negative drift. We have maybe an issue for check shot or, or sonic, but check shot is good, sonic is good. However, we have some uh, negative drift, so you have to keep that in mind. But actually, after synthetic, all of that will be over or, or will be captured by your uh, world seismic tie. And no worries about the world seismic tie, it will not be affected, but it will all of them will be added at the <coughs> the iterations or maybe you can adjust a little bit for for your uh, will to seismic tie maybe you have to make a slight uh, corrections or maybe a stretch and squeeze to have a better data to overcome this issue and thank you if you have any questions
Thank you very much for your question. Please, please, everyone, we'll really like to hear from you. Please fill our feedback form. The link has been dropped on the chat section of this meeting link. Please, we'll appreciate your feedback. Thank you very much. Do we have any other question, please? You can please indicate with the raise hand function. Thank you. Okay, thank you all so much for joining today's webinar. We really appreciate your time. The recording of this webinar will be shared as well as the presentation. Thank you for your questions. We appreciate the time and then your attention. Please take time to fill the feedback form. We will also be sending it to you to your respective mails. We we'll really like to hear from you. As we mentioned earlier, we can do a pilot study for free on a section of your field. Anybody interested in that can please send us an email to businessdevelopment at acquitlimited.com. If this is also a conversation that you'd like to take further, you can contact us and then we can organize a private session with your geologist within your organization and we can discuss further on this topic or any other technical issue that you might be experiencing. Thank you, Dr. Ali. Thank you, Dr. Um, Rami. Thank you, Dr. Shadi. We really appreciate your time. The presentation was very informative and that would have, that would have told from the questions that we got. We appreciate your time. Thank you all so much for joining. We'll see you at our next webinar series. What will happen in June? Thank you all so much for your time. We appreciate you. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much, Adibola, and thanks for all uh, our colleagues uh, in Akrit, and thanks for all the attendees. And happy to hear from you, as uh, Adibola mentioned. Uh, happy to hear from you. Happy to support you anytime uh, for anything. And we are waiting your feedback and uh, questions uh, all the time. Thank you so much. Thank you. That brings us to the end of today's webinar session. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, bye.